not what you do. It's not your strength. It's not how hard you can work. It's not how much money you can make or how much money you can give or all of the things that you can do. It's Jesus Christ. It's our hope and our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ and him and him alone. All right, book of James. Open up to James chapter 2 is where we're at today. And we're going to finish up James chapter 2 again. I think it's only taken me since May to get through the first two chapters of James. And I pray that you have been enjoying uh, the in-depth dive into this book here and seeing what James had to say for the New Testament church, because that's who he's speaking to is the New Testament Christians. Remember, he starts off saying, hey, I'm James. I'm a bond servant. He doesn't say, I'm James. I'm the half-brother of Jesus. I have it all together. He, he starts off saying he himself is a servant of Christ, just as the church, um, the New Testament churches of that day. So I titled the message, Walking Dead, yeah, kind of an interesting one. Um, I actually, this is a si side note, I actually had some former students of mine who ended up being extras on the TV show, Walking Dead. And I couldn't help but think about this whole time. I was, I was going to call them up because um, I'm still friends with their dad and just kind of say, hey, how did, how did that go for you and everything? But interesting story that we have this fascination in our society with this idea of the supernatural. But yet we don't want to talk about church. We don't want to talk about religion, but we'd love to talk about spirits and demons and, you know, of the undead walking the earth and all these different things. Well, James is kind of talking about that here. And I chose John chapter 15 as the, um, as, as the call to worship because Jesus is also speaking to this as well that, you know, sometimes... We're just the walking dead. That's all we are as Christians, you know. And I, I was thinking about when we moved into our place, you know, tw almost 20 years ago, we planted all these apple trees. And every spring, you know, the, we get that early frost in, you know, middle of uh, May. And I'm out there. I've got blankets and stuff. And I'm wrapping them around the trees trying to protect the blossoms. And it took almost 10 years for those trees to produce fruit. They're still apple trees, but they weren't producing anything. And there was a lot of times I wanted to go down there like Jesus talks about. And I wanted to just take a chainsaw and cut them off because I was tired of waiting on them to produce any fruit. And so James is speaking to the church here. And he starts off in verse 20. He says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Do you truly want to know this? And so we have to understand something here as James is speaking to the church and that true faith in God is more than just simply a set of words from a prayer that we prayed sometime. It's more than just this repetition of a powerful emotion that we have in a service because the, the worship team sang a really powerful song that just touched my heart or the preacher really told a really cool story and it touched my heart. It's more than just emotions in this case. And so James is, is speaking to this. And what we need to understand is that when we truly know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we truly know him, he's going to live through us and he's going to produce that fruit for the glory of God. And so a branch that doesn't bear fruit is a dead branch. A branch which bears fruit is alive. And we want to be that branch that is alive. We don't want to be that walking dead. We don't want to be that branch that doesn't produce fruit. So in, in, in our call to worship today, in verse 5 of John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And so that vine, he is that vine that we are going to attach to and we become that living fruit that comes out of that through Jesus Christ. So we are no longer that walking dead. And so in verse 26, James says in our reading today, he says, faith without works is dead, guys. And we're going to get into the proof that he lays out for us. If we don't have works that show our faith, then it, it, it's dead. So faith without works is dead. And so he has that argument that he starts off in verse 20 where we are today and we're picking up there. And so he says it's dead and that true faith in Jesus Christ, we have to understand, is always, always, always going to bring about salvation. When you have that true faith in Jesus Christ, 
you have that salvation experience there and you know that he is your Lord and Savior. And some people believe that all you have to do is, you know, go to a rally, go to a church service, sit down, say a simple little sinner's prayer and you're saved and you're headed for heaven. Boom, check mark off the box. I got it taken care of. Life is good. Life is grand. And then they move on with their life. They never bother to attend church again. Maybe they cuss like a drunken sailor. Maybe they drink like a fish. Maybe they're using drugs. I don't know. Maybe they live that promiscuous lifestyle, and yet they say, but I said a prayer. I'm checked off. Life is good. They believe that the prayer is the proof of their salvation. But James says, a faith which is not backed up by godly works it is dead. It is a dead branch. Dead means to be useless, to worthless, or lifeless. And so no matter how difficult that is for us to hear here today, no matter how difficult that is to put into our minds, put into our hearts and say, okay, yeah, I get this. It's the truth. Faith without works is dead. So why do we care? Why, 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 why do we even care? Why is this such a big issue here? Well, I think it's this. Because true salvation, true salvation, when you give your heart and your life over to Jesus Christ, you believe in him. Yes, he's the son of God. It's so much more than just a prayer. It's so much more than saying, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. I believe you are, you are God, that you created the heavens and the earth, that you sent your son to to be you know, the, the, the perfect, final, sinless, spotless lamb for me, that he died to death on the cross and that he was placed in the tomb and he rose three days later and he paid the price for my sin. Yes, I believe all that. It's so much more than a prayer. It's so much more than a simple profession of your faith in Jesus Christ. Here's the key. It is a radical conversion of who you once were. When you are truly convicted of your sinful condition, when you're drawn to Jesus Christ, you repent of your sins, you trust in his finished work on the cross. And see, so many people think they have to help Jesus along in that. When you believe and you trust in that finished work of the cross, you believe and you trust in the resurrection from the dead, that is your only, only hope of salvation. It's not anything that I can do. And when you get to this point right here, this is when you are radically changed and forever a new creature or a new creation in Christ that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, where he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation for old things. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. He didn't say that we're adding something to the old. He says the old is gone. It's passed away. It's no longer. You are a new creature, a new creation in Christ. All things have become new. See, you are no longer what you used to be. You are now raised to a new life in Jesus Christ. Paul puts it this way in Romans 6. He says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Did you get that? Did you hear what Paul said? He said the old man was crucified. If you are crucified, you are dead and buried. You are gone. You are no longer there. He says that your body is the sin. The old man might be done away with, that we are no longer a slave to that sin. That's what we're talking about when we speak of this radical transformation in Jesus Christ. What Paul is leading us to here is that there's going to be an evidence. There's going to be an evidence of your salvation in your life. Your life will prove the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 20, he said, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. We're going to see the evidence of a radically changed life. And so many times we, we, we get this idea, and we mentioned this in Sunday school, is that people get this idea that, well, if you go to church, you think you're perfect. 
You go to church, you think, oh, you, you got it all together, and you look down on me. And I'm not saying perfect here. I'm saying different from the world here. Because it's not that I'm perfect. It's not that I figured this out and I've got it all together and I'm living on some higher spiritual level than anybody else. It's Christ living in me that makes us different from the world around us. And as the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, 14, he said, For by one offering, he, speaking of Jesus, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And as I said in Sunday school, he doesn't say that Jesus was perfecting forever those who are already perfect. He's, he's, you're being sanctified. It is a process. It's a change process that we go through. And we learn and we develop and, and we, we read our Bible. We study the Word. And there, there's times where you can read the Bible passage a hundred times. And then you get to that one day you read it. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, now, now you're ready for it. Now we're going to tick up this process of sanctification a little bit. We're going to grow you a little bit more because now you're ready for it. Now you're showing me that there is a change, a radical change in your heart, in your life. See, we begin to seek after the things of God. That becomes our sole focus and our sole purpose in everything that we do. And then we begin to bear fruit for the glory of God. See, Paul understood this. Paul let the church in Corinthians know, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, he starts off right, right away. He says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. He didn't just say imitate me because I got it together. He said, because I'm following the perfect one. I'm following Christ. I'm following the one who defeated death, hell, and the grave, who rose victorious on that day. And see, so many of us in the church today are basing our hope of heaven on a prayer. And I can remember, I can remember this clearly as a kid you know, um, I'd, I'd go to some church event with a friend, and I, I can remember on ABC, you know, before um, uh, Sunday night football or whatever, or, or Sunday football games, they would usually have a Billy Graham crusade. And I, and I can remember watching that, and then I'm thinking, maybe I should pray that, just to be safe. I mean, there was no heart change. There was no um, radical conversion in my life. It was just simply... I want to make sure I got that get out of hell free card in my pocket. And that's all it was. There was nothing there. And so many people are basing that hope on a prayer that they prayed. But there's no evidence in their life that they have ever met Jesus because their faith is dead. And so therefore there's no works to show to prove that. And so how do we prove this? How does... Paul, or I'm sorry, how, how does James prove this to the readers of the day? So he has this argument that faith without works is dead, and then we're going to see the manifestation of those works here, and we're going to see the proof in verses 21 through 25. He says, in, uh, starting in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. And you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? So James is giving us proof here that your, your, your works is important here and your faith is important as well. And so... I, I find it interesting of the two examples that he uses here. I mean, he takes Abraham, the patriarch, the first father of the Jewish people, an upright man, a good man, and Rahab, a prostitute, a harlot. And he says, here, here's your example. Here's your proof of what I, I'm trying to tell you. So Abraham here, it, it, it talks about that Abraham offered Isaac his son on the altar, and he was justified by his works when he did that. 
And so how could Abraham obey God in this situation? I, I, I've thought about this. I've debated this. I've prayed about this. And, and, and I still don't understand completely. I can't wrap my human mind around this. How could Abraham obey God without any question, without any um, uh, reservation whatsoever? And, and, and we see that in, in, the, in the account in Genesis 12. And I think it's because Abraham remembered and Abraham trusted God's promise and he trusted God's character and he believed God would do what he said he was going to do. Abraham had incredible faith in this situation. And so Abraham, before he, we get to Isaac on the altar, we go back to Genesis 12 and we see God's promise to Abraham. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you, your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Abraham remembers this. Abraham trusted God even when God asked him to do the unthinkable. You know, Abraham wanted a son more than anything. And God promises him, hey, I'm going to make you a son. I'm, I'm going to make you a great nation and I'm going to give you a son. You just got to trust me. He doesn't, right? We, we know the story. He doesn't trust God. And through that, we get Ishmael. And through Ishmael, we get the line of uh, 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 Islam. But then Isaac comes along. And so Isaac is growing up. Abraham's thinking, life's good. See, God's fulfilling his promise. I'm being blessed. Look at all these things. And then God speaks to Abraham. And he says, oh, Abraham, here's what I want you to do in Genesis 22. He says, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Right there, stop. And nope, I'm out. I'm sorry. My son's not here. My oldest son's not here today, but I see Josiah came. Josiah, we're out. We're good. Okay. I'm not going to sacrifice you on the altar. I, 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 I would have stopped right there. I mean, the faith that Abraham had, he had that faith faith that God was going to fulfill the promises that he laid out for him. And so it goes on. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. Man, this is just amazing. And he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And this, this is the faith right here. This is the faith of Abraham. I mean, he's preparing everything. He's splitting the wood. He's got everything he needs, right? And then Abraham said to his young men in verse 5, Stay here with the donkey, for the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. What does that tell you about the faith of Abraham? He believed in the promises of God. He trusted the character of God. He knew deep down in his heart, his faith was so strong that he understood that God was going to fulfill that promise. And he tells his servants, We're, both of us, both of us are coming back. The writer of Hebrews tells us this, that Abraham believed that even if he had to kill Isaac, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice, God would raise him from the dead and still fulfill the promise that God had given Abraham. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 17, says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead." from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So Abraham was like, yeah, we're coming back. We're either coming back just like we are, or my son might be resurrected. He had that much faith. I don't know if I have that. I don't know if I could do that. And so Abraham here is giving evidence of his faith in God when he obeys God, when God commands him to offer up his only son Isaac as a burnt offering to him. That's a powerful testimony of the works and the faith of Abraham. 
See, Abraham's faith didn't stop with a simple salvation prayer. A simple, oh yeah, God's blessing me. His faith produced an obedience to God even when God's commands made absolutely no sense. Abraham's works gave evidence to his faith. So that's Abraham. Let's look at Rahab now. Again, Rahab, Rahab's not a Jew. Rahab is a Gentile. She's a prostitute living in a pagan community in um, the city of Jericho in the land of Canaan. She's a Canaanite. And Rahab, being in the business that she's in, she's going to hear a lot of information coming and going, right? She's going to hear all of the talkings and going on as people come in and out of the city walls. And so she hears of the miracles and the promises of this God, and it begins to awaken something in her. And she begins to wonder, she begins to think about those things. And so it awakens a little bit of her faith. And then she begins to listen to the stories, maybe in, in, in the shops, in the restaurants, or wherever she might be. And she begins to believe a little bit of what she's hearing. She had a trust She believed in a God she barely knew because she saw the evidence of the faith of the people who were coming and going. And she then proved her faith by taking in the spies, the Israeli spies, and hiding them and then helping them escape from the city. And because of this, we know that Rahab was saved and her family was saved and because she placed her faith and her hope and her trust in this God that she barely knew. I mean, she's a Jew, she's a Gentile, she's a prostitute. How in the world can this be an example of our faith that we have to have? Well, in Joshua 6, verse 23, it it reminds us that she was saved because of this. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought her out and all of her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. And so here's Rahab, she's saved from uh, everything that's going on here, and she proves her faith, again, by her works, by what she did. Rahab was brought out of the city of Jericho. She was brought into the nation of Israel, and then all of a sudden it stops, right? We don't hear anything else about Rahab. No, there's so much more here. She marries a man called um, Salmon, and, and, and Salmon and Rahab have a son. They have a son named Boaz. Boaz, in turn, marries a Gentile woman named Ruth. And in the end, Rahab becomes the great-great-grandmother of King David. And she becomes a direct ancestor to Jesus Christ. Total coincidence. Just an accident that this happened. No, it's because of her faith. She had this faith in a God that she barely even knew, and she proved it by her works, by taking in these spies, and God blesses her because of it. Rahab's faith in God brings about her salvation, and her works prove that she was truly saved. So that's this manifestation of our faith. The works come out. And then in verse 26... James says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So he makes this announcement. He closes out this chapter here and and, and letting the reader know that says, you know, your faith, if if you don't have works, your faith is dead. You can't just go to church, sit there, put a little money in the offering plate and then go out and live like the world and live like the devil. You have there has to be something. There has to be some fruit. Just as Jesus said, he goes, "If if there's no fruit there, I'm pruning you off. I'm taking care of that, getting rid of the dead branch. And so we need to understand that salvation doesn't come through just a simple little prayer. So there's so much more to it. It is through faith and faith alone in our God. Abraham believed God. He believed everything God told him, everything God asked him to do. Abraham believed it and God saved him. Rahab, a harlot, a prostitute, she believed in God And she did what God wanted her to do by taking in the spies. And God saved her and her family. See, this principle is true for you. This principle is true for me. It doesn't matter. John 
1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. See, we're brought into the family, and we can't earn that salvation. James has just spent the whole uh, part of uh, uh, chapter 2 talking about you can't earn anything. You can't go out and do amount of good works. Your good works are going to come out of your faith. And so you can't earn salvation through works. It's as effective as um, producing life as putting makeup on a dead corpse. Actually, it wouldn't be dead corpse. It'd just be corpse, wouldn't it? <laughs> so you put makeup on somebody, you make them look real good, and, and you go to the funeral visitation, they're still dead. We didn't bring them back to life because we made them look pretty. We made them look handsome. We made them look good. They're still dead. If you don't have faith in Jesus Christ and you do good works, your faith is dead. In order to be saved, you have to come through, through Jesus through faith and faith alone in him. Jesus said this very clearly in John 14, 6. He said, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way to salvation. And a lot of people say that, that that's narrow-minded. But I want, to look, I want you to look and see what he has to offer. What he brings to the table here. And you can go and you can say, well, what about the Hindus? What about the Buddhists? What about this? What about that? And if I make one little mistake, I'm out. If I do one little thing, wrong. Because, see, Jesus, he paid the price for all of those things. And he, all he asks is that I come to him in faith, that I believe in him. So salvation that I have Salvation that is given to me comes through faith. It comes through faith, and it is never, ever alone. You're never alone. And it's proven by each and every person as we read in the book of Hebrews. We read Hebrews chapter 11. We read through the hall of faith, and it goes on and on and on. And each person's deeds in that list is preceded by two simple words, by faith. By faith, by faith, over and over and over again. The writer of Hebrews lets us know that each and every one of these great patriarchs, each and every one of these great people of the faith, they had faith in God. They didn't, have, they didn't, they didn't see the proof of the promise. They didn't see Jesus Christ. They had the faith that God was going to do what God said he was going to do. They all understood Ephesians 2 Starting in verse 8, that is, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, we are created in Christ Jesus for this, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, a body without breath is nothing but bones, muscle, tissue. It's just there. In the same light, your faith, if you don't have root works, if you don't have the fruit of that faith, your faith is dead. Because see, when I breathe, when I move, all of those things are signs of life. They're all signs of life. That heart is beating. I'm moving. I'm breathing. I'm taking in air. I'm doing all these things. It's all signs of life. Works. Your works, the things that you do, the fruit of who you are in Jesus Christ are the signs of a spiritual life in a true believer. And no matter what you believe, no matter what you want to hold on to, God tells us in his word that your faith without works is dead. It is dead. We have to be, we have to have um, that, that, that fruit that other people can see. And see, so many times in the church, we think, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. And uh, I, I don't do a lot of bad things because there's people out there to do way worse things than me. So I'm okay. We try to justify our sins. 
And, you know, we, 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 we try to look the part. We try to wear the right clothes, say the right thing. You know, we got our cross that we wear every day so people can see it. And, you know, we got the little Jesus bumper sticker on the back of our car. And I had to laugh. I followed one um, home yesterday or Friday from work. It says, do you follow Jesus this close? I just... <laughs> It tells you something. I was close enough that I could read the bumper sticker. You know, so, but you know, we, we do stuff like that, right? We, we, we think that our faith is something that we adorn, something that we put on. But if you are a true convert in Jesus Christ, you don't receive the gospel. You don't receive the salvation in addition to your life. And this is central. This is key right here. You receive it in exchange change for your old life because as paul said you are a new creature you are a new creation in christ and so many of us want to go oh i said the prayer i i i prayed it i did everything i wanted to i'm supposed to do but man i really like this little bit over here of my old life so i'm going to hold on to this part over here and i'll just put on that christian stuff when i need to no you got to have that faith like Abraham. you got to have that faith like Rahab here. And it's, it's not in addition to, it's an exchange for that old life. And I remember having this conversation when I got saved. You know, my family wasn't too hip on it. My buddies that I ran around drinking and partying with, they definitely weren't hip on it. They didn't like it. And I remember telling a friend of mine, because he's like, hey, why don't you come out with us? You know, we were going to watch Monday Night Football at a bar or something. And I'm like, no. I said, I'm done. I said, that, that mat's dead and gone. And he's like, what? You're right here. I'm like, yeah. But the mat that would have went with you and done all the things you think I'm going to do with you, he gone. He's dead. He's no longer alive. Because as Paul wrote, he goes, when you are a new creature, or when you're in Christ, you're a new creature. It's not, I'm a mix you are new. You are completely new. God creates you in a beautiful new image. See, if your faith in Jesus is real, there is going to be proof in your life that you know Jesus Christ. There's going to be proof. And see, here's the thing. We all mess up, right? We all make mistakes. We talk about this in Sunday school. We all say things we shouldn't say, do things that we shouldn't do. And the biggest thing that I learned through that as I was growing in a Christian, is that when you do, you need to first admit it. You need to apologize to those you've offended, and you need to get it on your face before God and ask for his forgiveness and his guidance. And am I perfect in doing that? Are there times where I messed up and, and, and I didn't do those things? Yeah, there is. But that's, those are the things that mark us and make us different. Those are the things that James is referring to when he's talking about the works of the faith. When we do that, people look at you and go, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Nobody's ever said that to me before. Why, why, why are you apologizing for that? You were just, you know, whatever. I, I had a student this year, and I, I, I'm going to tell you, he's, he's, he's one of those, man. It just, if you had that button, he's the one that's pushing that button all the time. And, but he did something, and I just, I snapped. And he just came right back at me. So we stepped out in the hall had a little conversation, and he was mad. I mean, he was mad at me. He thought I'd wronged him. And I just, it was God. It was the Holy Spirit because I just, I said, okay. I said, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said what I said. I shouldn't have reacted the way I reacted. And you could see this kid's face just change instantly. Nobody's ever done that before. It was always a fight. It was always an argument. He had no idea how to react. That's what we're supposed to do. That's part of the fruit in our hearts and our lives that the world needs to see because the world doesn't do that. The world doesn't apologize. We take what's ours in the world. But yet, we need to live a life like Jesus. And we need to show the world the fruits of that. So is there proof in your life that you've been changed? Is there proof in your life that you've had that radical conversion? If not, I challenge you today to make today the day you come to Jesus. Because I'm telling you right now, he's here today. The Holy Spirit is here to call hearts and lives to him, to come to him. 
And some of you, again, I mean, I, I, I was there. It's like, well, I'm not as bad as the person next to you. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. I, I asked myself, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And then it just hit me one day. Well, Paul's pretty clear on that, that there hasn't been one righteous one, that we're all sinners. And we've all fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We're not good before the eyes of God. It's through the lenses of Jesus Christ that we are made holy and righteous. Do you understand that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation? That he is the way, the truth, and the life? That he is the only way to have your sins paid for and to live eternally in heaven with God? If you do, come to him today. Don't trust a prayer. Don't trust something that you just mumbled under your breath because you were just wanted to get that get out of hell free card. Don't trust your good works and the things you do. Don't trust anything. Don't trust anything but the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross because nothing else in this world will ever, ever save you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today and for the study of the book of James. And I just pray that you would continue to work in the hearts and the lives of the people here today. And Father, that we could have the faith in the promises that you lay out for us, that we can have the faith like Abraham, that we can have the faith like Rahab that we read about today. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would produce the fruits of our faith, Father, not of just simple works, but the fruits of our faith in you. Father, I pray that you work in our hearts and our lives today and that if there be anybody here today or, or watching online who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today is the day that they put their faith, their hope, and their trust in you and that they, Father, are radically changed for you and they become that new creature, that new creation in Christ. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. David.